Good morning. We are in Genesis chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8. So Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. This is what it says. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the, tree, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig, fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Well, today, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to talk to you about a story. This is a story of a man named Jerry. And Jerry was happily married to Lucy. And they had two boys, a house, and together they owned a small business. And this business allowed them to live a very comfortable life. And both of their boys attended private schools. They traveled every other month. They were continually buying new vehicles. And by the end of 1998, they were in the process of, of buying a vacation home. So they were doing really great. And apparently, um, Jerry had it all. He had a beautiful, loving family. He had a very decent estate. He had healthy finances and professional success. But there was something missing in Jerry's life. Jerry was not satisfied. Jerry was not happy. So one day, Jerry, privately, in his mind, decided that he had sacrificed so much throughout his life and that he deserved to be happy. So Jerry went on and had an extramarital affair, and then another, and then another, until he finally found the person that would really make him happy, a sophisticated, well-educated young woman who was half the age of his wife. Lucy, on the other hand, was not ready to forego 23 years of marriage just like that. So she made every effort to save her marriage. And at the same time, while this is happening, their 20-year-old son pleaded over and over with his father to reconsider. Even Jerry's own mother and sister warned him of the unforeseen consequences of this decision. But Jerry had made up his mind. Jerry abandoned his family, taking with him everything they had worked for along the years. And according to Jerry, he needed to focus all his attention and his resources to pursue this new and better relationship. Needless to say, Jerry had destroyed his family. So today we're going to see something similar with Adam and Eve. Specifically, the woman sought to obtain something that she was not given at a cost she could never have imagined. So in chapters 1 and 2 of this book of Genesis, we saw God bringing life and order into being. We saw God's wisdom and goodness, and there was order and there was beauty in everything that God created, and there was abundance in everything God had provided. And then by the end of chapter 2, we saw that the man and the woman lived in a state of innocence and absolute trust in which nakedness was their normal condition. They had no shame 
because they had no guilt. They were oblivious to evil and danger. They lived in paradise. Everything was perfect. Unfortunately, everything is about to change here in chapter 3. The man and the woman are about to learn the consequences of disobeying God. A theologian by the name of Griffith Thomas, who was one of the co-founders of the Dallas Theological Seminary, he said that the third chapter of the book of Genesis is the pivot on which the whole Bible turns. The pivot on which all the whole Bible turns. I think he was right. Moses begins this pivotal chapter saying in verse 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Chapter 2, as I mentioned, ended with the man and the woman joined in matrimony and in a state of innocence. But now, suddenly, unexpectedly and mysteriously, a serpent appears in the Garden of Eden. And this happening creates all sorts of questions. Where did this serpent come from? Was it inside the garden? Did it come from outside the garden? How did it get there? And how is it that it can speak? How did the, the serpent has this ability? And, and what is the name of the serpent? So the answer to all of these questions is the same. We do not know. It's a mystery because Moses did not give us that information. However, later on, in the New Testament, in Revelation chapter 12 and, and chapter 20, John will tell us that the serpent of which Moses speaks here in Genesis 3 is none other than the devil, is Satan himself. Now, I do know and I acknowledge that speaking about Satan is uncomfortable for many, and rightfully so. Yet, we need to be aware of him because he was there when Genesis was unfolding, and he will be there when the prophecies of the book of Revelation come to pass. Satan is a formidable enemy because he is wiser and stronger than us. He prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. In fact, in John chapter 8, the Lord Jesus Christ called him a murderer from the beginning and the father of lies. And then in the same Gospel of John, in, ver in chapters 12 and 14, the Lord Jesus calls Satan the ruler of this world. Later in Ephesians, in chapter 2, Paul reinforces this concept by referring to him as the prince of the world. And what this means is that Satan is the one who motivates and empowers the world system. He is the one who mobilizes the sons of disobedience. So we need to be aware of the fact that he and his demons are still at work today. You just need to look around you, turn on the news, open that newspaper, and you will see evidence of his work in every aspect of our lives. So Satan is an enemy that must not be ignored, much less dismissed. Therefore, we need to know, as Christians, how is it that he operates? Now, back in our text, while Moses did not speak about the name or the origin of the serpent, he did speak about its character and its origin. About its character, Moses said that the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field. Now, here we need to look at a Hebrew adjective. The Hebrew adjective, yarum, translated in the New American Standard as crafty. And this word can also be translated, and probably you have one of these translations in your Bibles, as shrewd or cunning, clever, sensible, or prudent. So these terms convey the idea of being aware, of knowing where the danger is, or of being aware or knowing where the traps lay. And this ad adjective, interestingly enough, appears nowhere else in the book of Genesis. However, in the book of Proverbs, this is the same adjective that is used to commend those who possess these traits. In fact, Proverbs also contrasts those who are crafty with those who are foolish. So what does this mean? Well, it means that the word crafty can have a positive or a negative connotation depending on the context. So here in our text, craftiness will be used for an evil purpose. 
the serpent is going to use its craftiness for evil. So, the word crafty indicates that Satan was very subtle in his actions. He came disguised as a serpent, disguised as, sub as a subordinate creature. Satan presented himself as just one of the many animals over whom the man and the woman were to exercise dominion. So, externally, the serpent appeared to be a harmless friend. But internally, the serpent was an evil spirit whose purpose was to deceive. His purpose was to bring temptation and doubt. Now, about the origin of the serpent, Moses does not address the origin of evil and how it overtook the snake. Once again, those are mysteries that God did not reveal to us. What Moses is doing here is he's simply making it clear that the serpent was one of the many animals made by God. And this explanation completely eliminates the possibility that the serpent could be considered to be some kind of supernatural or divine force that owed its origin to someone or something other than God. In other words, Moses here is denying the concept of dualism, which is the idea that good and evil have always existed from the very beginning. And some of you may be aware of what the yin and the yang is, is that you know, circular symbol that is you know, like uh, half black and half white, and this represents some sort of uh, balance between good and evil. And, and that idea is false. That is not true, that doesn't, uh, that, that's not reality. This is not what Moses is teaching here, in fact, he's denying it. What Moses is actually teaching us here is the origin of human sin and the origin of human guilt. That's what's been taught here. Then in the second half of verse one, we read, and he said to the woman, indeed has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Once again, there is a detail without explanation. How was it that the serpent had the ability to speak? Moses did not explain that. What matters here is not who the serpent is or how is it that it speaks. What really matters is what the serpent said. The attention here is centered on the words of the serpent. Why? Well, because the serpent's craftiness is ultimately the voice of Satan. So, as I already mentioned, the serpent presents itself as a harmless subordinate, and this apparently harmless animal is shocked by something that God had said. He cannot believe that the Lord said something like this. So, in fact, this creature is so concerned that he comes and asks the woman, did God really say, did God actually say that you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? I cannot believe it. How can this be? This is kind of what's happening. This is the idea. Obviously, they didn't say those words, but this is what's, what's happening here. So with this question, specifically with the phrase, really say or actually say, Satan is introducing doubt. Now, if you keep your finger there for a minute and, and then go back just a few paragraphs back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, in chapter 2, verse 16, you will find that the Lord God commanded the man, saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely. So, as you can see in this verse 16, God gave them free access to all the trees except from one. Now, back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, notice how Satan's version is, just slightly different. It's just a tad different than one what God had originally said. Satan version of 2.16 says, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. That's it. So this slightly different version is absolutely restrictive. This was not an innocent mistake. This was not a simple misunderstanding. Satan knows the truth and he knows it very well. Therefore, rather than flagrantly lying, Satan presents a half-truth. He just gave enough truth mixed with just the right amount of falsehood in order to make the Word of God believable 
and yet restrictive and unfair. And this reminds me of Charles Spurgeon when he said that discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong, it is knowing the difference between right and almost right. Let me say this again. Discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It is knowing the difference between right and almost right. Half-truths are dangerous and destructive because as I said, they have enough truth in them to make them seem believable. And we have a lot of that going on today. Now, back then, as it continues to be the case today, Satan's purpose was to introduce doubt by questioning God's motivation, by questioning God's truthfulness, and by questioning God's fairness. And what Satan is subtly implying here is that the word of God is not really true, and that is, therefore it is subject to human judgment and approval. So Satan implies that we, humans, the creation, the creature, have the ability, the power, and the authority to determine what is true and what is false. So in this case, we have the ability, the power, and the authority to decide whether the God of word is true or not. Now, it is my opinion, based on what I have read, that this particular issue is evident within the feminist movement in the church. Many of those who sympathize with this um, idea, many of those who promote the, the idea that churches must allow women to become elders and pastors do so under the banner of fairness. And they question the Bible's truthfulness in regard to leadership at home and in the church. So in their minds, this group of people ask, did God really say that only men are supposed to lead the church? How is it fair that only men are able to become pastors and preachers or elders? So this group of people believe that if men have access to leadership positions, in, specifically in the church, it is only fair for women to have the same opportunity. And some of these people go as far as to question Paul's motivation for his teaching in 1 Tim Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, where he said, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Some have said that Paul's word are a consequence of an outdated and chauvinistic society that had little to no regard for women, and therefore, Paul's teaching does not apply in our times, and it should be rejected. Others have suggested that there is an error in the translation of the word authority. And they go to the Greek and they try to justify their point. And supposedly this error is perpetrated by the patriarchy that supposedly dominates every aspect of, of our life. But regardless of the excuse that they come up with, the fact of the matter is that these people now have become authorities and judges over the word of God. They have taken it upon themselves to determine which parts of the Bible are acceptable and which ones are not. And they have taken it upon themselves to correct the quote unquote mistakes of the Bible. And it is preposterous. Now back in our text, in verses two and three, the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. Now, here we can see that the strategy of the serpent is working. The woman appears to defend God's word with her response, but in reality, she was really not defending it. The sad fact is that she represented, she exaggerated what God had commanded in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 through 17. Let me read it again. This is what the Lord said. The Lord commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and from, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Now I want you to notice four things here. First, Eve omitted three words from God's original command. The words any, freely, and surely. 
And by omitting the words any and freely, she lessened God's goodness and abundant provision. And by omitting the word surely, the woman also lessened the severity of the consequence for disobedience. The woman implied that death was simply a possibility. We could die, we may die. However, God's original words are much more forceful and definitive. He said, you will surely die. Death was not a possibility. It was a certainty if they disobeyed. Second, the woman identified the tree of, the good, of knowledge of good and evil by its location, not by its actual name and by its importance. She just said the tree in the middle of the garden. The third thing is that following the example of the serpent, the woman uses the name God rather than the covenant name Lord. And fourth, the woman also added the phrase, or touch it, making God's command much more stringent and restrictive. God did not say they could not touch it, but Eve said so. Now in contrast to the serpent, the woman had no malicious intent in her reinterpretation of the command. However, all of this is evidence of her hesitation. There is now confusion and doubt in her mind. This doubt has moved the woman away from God and closer to the serpent. And then in verse 4, the serpent takes advantage of the situation to challenge God's command directly. The serpent said to the woman, you will surely not die. Satan's emphasis here is, no, is on the word not. It's emphatic, you will not die. And what Satan is saying here is that what God had said was not true, that God was lying. So the implication here is not only that Satan knows better than the woman, but that Satan knows better than God. And this right here, is the very first attack against the Word of God. Because if the Word of God, which is the final authority over all matters, is false, if it's not true, then there would be no rules, no accountability, and no penalty or consequences for anything whatsoever. If the Word of God is, is not true, then we can do whatever we want with absolutely no consequences. It would be an absolute free for all. That's what Satan is implying. Then in verse 5, the serpent explains further, saying, For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In verse 4, Satan, as we just saw, accused God of being a liar. And now here in verse 5, the serpent now accuses God of being selfish, jealous, and deceptive. According to Satan, God was actually holding them back. God was preventing them from being happy and fulfilled by forbidding them from eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God knew that if they ate the fruit, they would become like him. And God did not like that idea. So in order to protect himself, God put in place all these prohibitions because God didn't really care for them. God cared for himself. So all of these rules were nothing more than a burden preventing the man and the woman from following their desires and becoming all they could be. And with these words, the serpent presents the woman with the possibility of becoming, becoming more than she was and more than God had intended her to be. The serpent assures her that there will be no penalty for disobeying God. In fact, Disobedience would be a good thing because it would open her eyes to an awareness and a knowledge that she did not have before. So eating the forbidden fruit would be good because she would become wise and knowledgeable as God. What a turn of events. Now with the serpent's assurance of no consequences for disobeying God and with the serpent's promise of becoming like God, the woman now has every reason and every confidence to do what God had commanded not to do. So in verse six, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, 
she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. At this point, someone may be wondering, why do I keep calling her woman? Well, that's what my wife was asking me. Why don't you call her Eve? Well, yes, I know. We, we all know her name is Eve, and this is actually who we're speaking about. But as you may recall from last time I was here, Adam names her woman to highlight the fact that the source of the woman is man. Isha was taken out of Ish. Woman was taken out of man. So the name woman signifies that they both share the same nature, the same essence, the same source. So that's her name. Now, Eve will be her name after salvation, but that's going to occur in, chapter, in verse 20. And just like the name woman, the name Eve will also carry a profound meaning, and I will cover that in a future lesson. So in order to remain true to the text, I'm addressing here as woman. Now, the woman saw. This is what this verse says, the woman saw. In Genesis 1, we read that it was God who saw what was good. Only God knew what was good. Only God declared things good. But here in verse 6, it is now the woman who saw what was good. So the implication here is that even before she has eaten the fruit, the woman has already taken over God's role of knowing what's good for her. The woman saw that the tree was good for food. It was physically appealing. She saw that it was a delight to the eyes, meaning that it was aesthetically pleasing, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, meaning that it would transform her mind by giving her wisdom. One interesting fact here is that the Hebrew verb nahmad, translated as desirable, is the same Hebrew verb translated in the, in the Ten Commandments in Exodus and Deuteronomy as covet. So the point here is that the woman saw the fruit and she coveted it. All of this happened because the woman listened to Satan rather than God. Satan's words were very appealing, so much so that the temptation produced doubt and doubt turned into disbelief. And as a result, the woman sought to know what is good apart from God's provision. She tried to be independent from God because she wanted to be like God. Then she took the fruit and she ate. The woman's disbelief now has turned into an outright rejection of God and his word. And to make matters even worse, the woman gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Now the question here is whether or not Adam was there with his wife when she was approached by the serpent. So was Adam there all along or did he just show up suddenly? And there's different views about this. Moses didn't actually, uh, he didn't explicitly say. However, I think that Adam was there all along and I'm gonna to explain to you why. I may be wrong, but this is why I think he was there. It's uh, three reasons. In verse one through five of this chapter in the Hebrew, the pronoun used for you is always in the plural. And that indicates to me that Adam, Adam was there witnessing what was happening. The serpent is addressing Eve, but say, uh, Adam was there watching. The second evidence to me is the sequence in which the events unfold in verse six. Verse 6 says, she saw the fruit, she took the fruit, she ate the fruit, she gave the fruit, and he ate. So this sequence of events leads me to believe that she did not call him from a distance, say, hey, come over here. She didn't go looking for him to the other side of the garden because he was just right next to her, so she just gave it to him. And then this leads us to the third reason, which is that this, the text says she gave also to her husband with her. So indicating that Adam was right there with her. So she just passed the fruit. But as I said, I may be wrong. Um, that is my view. Now, what is clear here, Paul makes abundantly clear in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, and 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, 
was that it was Eve who was deceived by the serpent and not Adam. Eve may have been oblivious to the serpent's craftiness, but Adam was not. He had no excuse to be involved in these events. Adam may, may or may not have been there the whole time, but there's still no indication in the text that would suggest that he was deceived by the serpent. In fact, Paul says he was not deceived by the serpent, it was Eve. However, the point here is not whether Adam was there all along or not. The point here is that he took the fruit. And according to the text, the woman did not tempt him. She simply gave him the fruit. As I said, she just passed it. And rather than challenging this action, rather than raising any objections, rather than saying no, he simply went along and ate the fruit. The woman took the initiative and she ate the forbidden fruit. And seeing, when the man saw that she did not die, just like the serpent had promised, then Adam follows his, followed his wife's, ex, wife's example and accepted the fruit and without hesitation, he ate it willingly. And with this action, Adam rebelled against God who was not only his creator, not only his provider, he was his friend. And he rebelled against them. Verse seven, then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sold fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. The serpent's promises became true, but not completely. Not in the way the man and the, uh, the woman expected. The serpent only spoke about the things she would gain, but never spoke about the things she would lose in the process. Neither the man nor the woman died physically, not immediately. However, they did immediately die spiritually, and eventually, they would also die physically. Their eyes were indeed opened, but not to the coveted knowledge of good and evil. Instead, what they saw was that they were naked. The man and the woman are no longer innocent. Their nakedness now exposes their guilt. And what used to be pleasing to their eyes had now become a source of displeasure and shame. So in an attempt to hide their shame, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Unfortunately, this newfound wisdom was incapable of solving their problem. They knew that their man-made coverings were worthless. So in verse eight, when they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, the man and his woman hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So, it is early in the evening, and God has come to the Garden of Eden to have fellowship with the man and the woman. And I imagine that at this time, this, this, uh, God would be there to teach them things. This would be a time when God would talk to them about himself, a time when God would answer their questions and they would answer God's questions. This was a time when man had the privilege to be in the presence of God, listening to his voice and communing with him. But rather than welcoming him, the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God, presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Guilt, shame, and fear are the new driving forces behind their thoughts and actions. Not only did they, not, did they try to cover their nakedness with fig leaves, they were not trying to hide from God behind the trees. The man and the woman now know for certain that their relationship with God has been severed because of their disobedience. Their friendship is over. In fact, they are now enemies of God. And of course, there is nowhere to hide from the all-seeing eyes of God. And worst of all, there is nothing they can do to restore their relationship with God. There is an infinite chasm bef before them, and they cannot bridge it. And the sad reality is that this is our present condition apart from Jesus Christ. Those who have not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation are enemies of God. And on their own, 
they are absolutely incapable of reconciling with him, no matter what they think, no matter what they do, whether they agree with it or not. They cannot reconcile with the Lord by their own means. The woman listened to Satan rather than God. The appeal of something new drove the man and the woman to exchange wisdom for death. They sought what they thought was good apart from God's original design and generous provision. Adam and Eve sought to be like God, but they were already made in the image of God. And Jerry, the guy from my opening illustration, was already married, but he abandoned his wife to pursue a new and better wife. Just like Adam and Eve, Jerry succumbed to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful, boastful pride of life. And just like Adam and Eve, Jerry eventually realized that the promises he had believed in his heart came with unexpected consequences. The years went by, and Lucy had the blessing of seeing both her boys graduate from college, become self-sufficient, get married, and have children of their own. And now, 25 years later, Lucy has not remarried, and personally, she has not enjoyed the financial success that once she did with her husband. However, she does have the unconditional love of her sons, their wives, and her three grandchildren. Jerry, Jerry thought that pursuing a forbidden relationship would bring him happiness, and it did for a while. Eventually, Jerry's business declined. His new wife and his new children do not honor him or respect him. The luster of that new marriage has long been gone, and Jerry has not seen or spoken to his sons in many years, and he has never met his grandchildren. This are the irreparable consequences of sin, of his sin. So I'll, let me leave you with this. Sin always has consequences. The words of the serpent brought chaos, sorrow, and death, but the word of God brings life, peace, and joy. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ who is um, our Savior and who brought reconciliation to your children with you. It is through him that we are reconciled to you, Father. We thank you for that. Thank you for his sacrifice on the cross. We ask you, Lord, that if there's anyone listening to this message, that you will allow them to place their trust and their faith in Christ as their Savior. There is no salvation apart from him. And in his name we pray. Amen.